study of the uh, Sermon on the Mount. We're uh, moving through this at a, I won't say a breakneck pace, but it's going pretty fast. We have finished uh, chapter 5, and as we ended last Sunday, we, uh, we ended on uh, Matthew 5, 48, the last verse in chapter 5, which said, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. You'll recall that we talked about the fact that perfect is also translated often as mature or uh, full-grown. And so the, the mandate here is not to be perfect because we know that, uh, that we can't be perfect. But we can mature and we can continue to grow and become more Christ-like in the things that we uh, do and say. We talked a little bit about, as we ended, about the phrase, no one is perfect, and how we use that for uh, self-justification when we do something that we know is wrong. And uh, uh, for those of you who know me, you probably know that I'm a, a cartoon addict, and I feel like that I often learn as much from the cartoons as I do from the front page in terms of what's going on in the world. But uh, after last Sunday, when we, uh, when we talked about this, no one is perfect, uh, the very next day or so, there's a cartoon that I read regularly called Prickly City. It's a kind of a satire on uh, what's going on in uh, government right now. But uh, the two characters that are there are Winslow, which is a little uh, coyote, and Carmen, who is a little girl. And uh, Winslow says to Carmen, no one is perfect, Carmen. And she answers back, no, indeed not, Winslow. Yet when people find imperfection in others, we mock and ostracize them. Carmen says, yes, we do. And so Winslow says, so let me get this straight. An imperfect society filled to the brim with imperfect people has the gall to judge those who are imperfect. Carmen says, yep. Says, hard to believe that you folks are always unhappy. Is what Winslow says. And Carmen says, we're not always unhappy. We enjoy pointing out others' mistakes. Oh, well, that was pretty realistic to what we had just been talking about and to what often happens to us as human beings. We, uh, we most often, when we point to someone's imperfection, it typically is something that is our own imperfection, and we have less tolerance for that imperfection in others than we do that imperfection in ourselves. In any event... Uh, Christ has been teaching us how we ought to react and how we ought to behave and how we ought to involve and uh, associate with others throughout the entire chapter 5. We'll continue that in chapter 6 and chapter 7 as we wrap up the Sermon on the Mount. So we're ready to start this morning with uh, Jesus' teaches about uh, giving to the needy, which is the first four verses of Matthew 6. Will you join me in a word of prayer as we begin? Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the, the privilege that we have, for the technology that allows us to continue to study, even when we uh, can't come together uh, and interact uh, directly. Father, we uh, are thankful for your word and for what it teaches us about how Christ uh, behaves and how we ought to uh, then react and interpret the things that uh, he has told us. We uh, are thankful that, uh, that we can grow and mature and uh, that we uh, do have the capability of being uh, perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect in the sense of growing and maturing as uh, Christians. We ask you to go with us as we study today, guide and direct our, our thoughts and our hearts uh, give us always a, 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 an enthusiasm for your word, for learning and growing and uh, becoming more Christ-like in our actions and our activities. These things we ask uh, Christ in Christ's name. Amen. 
So, as we get ready to begin uh, Matthew 6, verses 1 through 4, a uh, question for thought. Isn't it easier to do what's right when we gain recognition and praise? In fact, that's sort of the philosophy of raising kids uh, today. We, uh, we praise them uh, just for being, just for participating, uh, to try to build up their self-esteem. And that carries over into later life as, as uh, wanting recognition and praise uh, for anything and everything that we do, especially when we do something right. To be sure our motives are not selfish, we should do our good deeds quietly or in secret with no thought of reward is what Christ is going to teach us. <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus says we should check our motives in three areas. The generosity or almsgiving, uh, verses, uh, the first four verses. In the next verses, we're going to talk about prayer, and that will be a little bit longer study than the almsgiving. And then the third motive was fasting, uh, which is down in uh, verse 18. So uh, these three uh, areas... Uh, were very common and popular among the Jews of Jesus' day. Uh, fasting, not so much for us, I think. Uh, at least I've never uh, been in a congregation where fasting was taught or practiced uh, directly. It may be something that people do and are capable of doing individually. Uh, but we're going to talk about that because there are things that we can learn uh, even from, uh, from that, even if we... Uh, don't practice fasting in our current lives. Those acts should not be self-centered, if you will, but God-centered. Done not to make us look good, but to make God look good. And that's what uh, the theme of much of uh, the Sermon on the Mount has been about. has been uh, to uh, give credit and show credit to uh, our Father in, uh, in heaven. God does not promise material reward. Doing something only for ourselves is not a loving sacrifice. Check the motives behind your next good deed by asking, Would I still do this if no one knew what I did or knew that I did it? In Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, Jesus said, Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Well, think about that. At first reading, uh, these words seem to contradict what Jesus told his disciples in uh, chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, where he said, Let your light shine before others so they may see your good works. Well, is that a contradiction? I think not. I, I think uh, that uh, no contradiction exists there because in 516, Jesus gave his disciples the correct motive that people might give glory to your Father in heaven. So there he was saying that the things that you do need to be done to uh, let your light shine so that you will be an example and so that your heavenly Father will gain the glory, not you. Jesus warned that doing good works, which he's called acts of righteousness here, so that others might see and praise you for what you're doing, or you would, uh, that you will earn no reward from your Father in heaven. The phrase acts of righteousness can be translated different ways, but what it really means is to do what is right. Jesus pointed out three specific types of acts of righteousness that the Pharisees practiced religiously. Many with great fanfare and notice, almsgiving, prayer, and fasting. For these three were central to their expression of obedience to God. While all of these acts have the, have the potential and the capability of glorifying God, some of the Pharisees did them only to bring honor to themselves. In these words, Jesus was focusing on the motive behind any good deed. 
God rewards good deeds done for his glory alone. He does not reward good deeds done through recognition, display, applause, honor. In fact, as Jesus explains in 6.5, the valued reward from others is the only reward that will be received. A writer by the name of Campbell Morgan kind of hit the nail on the head when he noted that, and I'll quote him, probably the vast majority of people are more influenced by what men will say than what, what God Almighty thinks. We tend to want the uh, approval and the praise of our fellow men, our fellow human beings. In Matthew 6, verse 2, Jesus said, So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. So the first act of righteousness that Jesus used as an example was almsgiving. The Jewish law commanded that people give to those in need as recorded in Deuteronomy 15, verses 10 and 11. He says, Give liberally and be ungrudging when you do so. For on this account, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all that you undertake. Since there will never cease to be some in need on earth, I therefore command you, open your hand to the poor and needy neighbor in your land. So this was one of the early commands that the Jewish people uh, were to practice. They were to take care of the poor and the needy. Jesus expected his followers to do likewise, following God's law. Notice that he said, not if you give. He said, when or whenever you give alms. That is, then whenever you give to the needy. So it's not something that he says is an option it's, uh, it's not if, it's when. However, Jesus' followers were to have a different motive for their giving than did the hypocrites. Uh, hypocrite is a Greek word, or comes from a Greek word, for uh, which meant actor, or one who wore a mask and pretended to be something that he or she wasn't. The term hypocrite is used here describes people who do good acts for appearance only to be praised by others, not out of compassion or other good motives. Many of the religious leaders uh, did just this. Later in Matthew 23, verses 13 through 29, Jesus called the Pharisees hypocrites, actors, people who wore a mask, uh, so that others wouldn't really know who they were or what they were. The phrase, sound a trumpet before you, uh, probably is not literal, but it pictures people calling attention to themselves, people who blow their own horns or toot their own horns. And uh, that's perhaps a statement that uh, comes from this portion of Scripture uh, about people who toot their own horns. The actions may be good, but their motives are hollow. Like actors in a play, they give their gifts in front of an audience, hoping for praise. That's what they're after, the praise of their fellow humans. These empty acts and whatever human praise is received are the only reward these hypocrites will receive for their trouble. God will, regard, will reward those who are sincere in their faith and whose motive in all their good deeds is to glorify him or to give him the glory. Jesus emphasized the importance of giving to those in need. He didn't say if, he said when. Assuming the giving, even as he was directing how the giving should be carried out, his repeated rephrase was, when you give, not if you give. Helping other people becomes a real adventure if we remain anonymous. Regardless, we still must help others. We may have to live through times when our acts of generosity are neither recognized 
nor appreciated. What can you do to give to those in need? Well, that's something you have to answer for yourself. It may be through the church directly. It may be directly to your favorite charity. It may be uh, in any of a number of other ways. Uh, Billy Graham often said, God has given us two hands, one for receiving, one for giving. In chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, uh, Jesus said, But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. So Jesus, uh, in, in chapter 6, verse 2, explained how his disciples were not to give alms. Those verses describe how he wanted him. These verses describe now how he wants them to give. In the phrase, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, he was teaching the motive for giving to God and to others that that motive must be pure. The phrase is, uh, is hyperbole, that is, it's an extreme example, to, em to emphasize, if you will, the total lack of ostentation. In the phrase, uh, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, he was teaching that the motives for giving to God and to others must be pure. So, uh, this hyperbole in Christ is often used, as have, have uh, Paul and others in their writings in the New Testament, uh, have used extreme examples. Uh, no one should call attention to the act. It's easy to give with mixed motives, to do something for someone if it will benefit us in return. And you know, I think as humans, we often... Uh, accept an invitation to someone's home for dinner uh, under, the, uh, under the understanding that, well, now we're going to have to invite them to our home for dinner. That we're going to have to pay them back. We're obligated to do in return for some, uh, someone something that did, did something for us. Uh, so now I guess the next question is, and this can all be interpreted in different ways but does this mean that we should not get tax benefits for our gifts does are, are we uh, are we being ostentatious and uh, and uh, seeking praise for uh, these tax benefits um, Jesus advised that giving be done in secret and the answer is no uh, Jesus words do not forbid record-keeping receding or reporting procedures used in good stewardship for tax records. But he condemned the practice to impress others. You know, I, I uh, worried about that a bit when, uh, when we started studying this. Uh, and then it dawned on me that there's nothing I'm going to do that's going to impress a tax auditor or a tax man. And so, therefore, uh, I don't have to worry about it being impressive to them. He condemned the practice to impress others. Jesus' followers should give generously out of compassion when there is a need. God rewards such giving. The word for reward used here is from the word used in 6.2. It is, is different from the word used in 6.2. For the reward is very different. The hypocrites receive praise from humans alone as their only reward. Those who give in secret, however, will receive a reward from their father. A reward of greater value because it will be perfect and eternal. It's nearly impossible to keep the secret amount of charitable giving you do today. Donors are required by tax authorities to keep very accurate records. And the larger the gift, the more people must keep a record of it. When Jesus said to keep your gifts a secret from even yourself, uh, he again was using hyperbole to warn against self-glorifying demonstrations. Yet Christians can and should apply the spirit of Jesus' teachings even while keeping accurate financial record. 
What Jesus tells us is that we don't need to get proud of our generosity. Remember, we are only a steward of resources that belong to God already. He said, uh, don't give for the honor bestowed on donors. Instead, give for the gratitude uh, for what God has given you. We are blessed in this nation, and it's easy to uh, understand that we've been given great riches. And it's easy then, or should be easy, for us to cheerfully return a portion of that uh, to those in need. And he says, don't count your gifts as merit points for heaven. Well, how many times have we talked about the fact that we can't buy our salvation or our way into heaven? God will reward, will reward us generously, but not on the invoice that we hand him or the gifts that we've been giving. Every time you give, <coughs> excuse me, count it as a reminder of your freedom from the power of money and of your trust in Jesus alone for the good things that you have. As we move on to uh, Matthew 6, verses 5 through 15, Jesus is going to talk about prayer. And it's in this passage that we're going to get through the Lord's Prayer, or what we call the Lord's Prayer. But beginning in verse 5, And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. There's that word again. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that there may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. This passage bothers some folks, just like giving did. If you're not supposed to, uh, if you're supposed to give in secret, why is it okay to keep tax records and take the tax benefit? Here, does this mean that we shouldn't pray publicly? That there shouldn't be corporate prayers? Well, we're going to talk about that as we move through this. The second act of piety or righteousness that Jesus addressed was prayer. Some people, especially the religious leaders, wanted the people to think that they were really very holy. And public prayer was one of the ways to get attention. Jesus saw through their self-righteous acts. He called these men hypocrites for praying not to God, but to an audience of people who revered them for their apparent holiness. Jesus assumed that his followers would pray. Again, he didn't say if you pray, he said whenever you pray. Prayer in the synagogue was not unusual. However, those who prayed on the street corners certainly had motives other than piously observing the exact prayer time. Although prayers in the streets were acceptable, on fasting days in this society in which Jesus was addressing. So prayer on the street was a, an acceptable practice, something that was done. But again, just to pray on a street corner except on a fasting day, and if it was on a fasting day, it was probably to call attention to the fact that you were fasting. And so Jesus wanted to correct those feelings about the Pharisees and what they were doing. When people prayed in those locations, not to God, but merely so that they may be seen by others, they were not praying at all. Jesus taught that we find the essence of prayer, not in public, but in private communication with God. We have uh, we've talked, at least uh, I in one of my earlier sermons talked about prayer. And the fact that as we pray to our Father in private, it ought to be more like a conversation than it is simply a request. And that's one of the mistakes that we make. Is the only time we go to God is when we want to make a request. But I think we see in terms of what Jesus does and, and the way prayer will be taught is that it truly is in private a conversation with our Father. So again, let me remind you, Jesus taught that we find the essence of prayer not in public, but in private communication with God 
a conversation with our Heavenly Father, much like we might have with an earthly father. Confess our sins. Tell him what went wrong. Tell him what went right. How was the day? Was it a good day? Were there things that you did that you shouldn't have done? Were there things that you could have done that you didn't do? Those are the types of conversation that you have with God in private. Uh, if you are truly uh, in a prayerful spirit and a prayerful attitude. There is a place for public prayer. But to pray only where others will notice you indicates that your real intention is to please people, not God. For these hypocrites, the people's praise will be their only reward. Well, again, the question for thought is do Jesus' words question the appropriateness of all public prayer? Can public prayer draw attention to God without drawing attention to the one praying? Did Jesus himself practice closet praying exclusively? Well, if you think about what you know and from Scripture, the answer to that is no. The Gospels record Jesus at prayer both privately in chapter 14, verse 23, and publicly in chapter 14, verses 18 and 19. So Jesus did both. Well, that must mean that it's okay for us to do both. Later, his disciples carried on a tradition of corporate prayer from the earliest days of the church, as is read and recorded in Acts 1, verse 14. As he did with giving, Jesus drew attention to the motives behind the actions. The point really wasn't a choice between public and private prayer, but between heartfelt and hypocritical prayer. We must learn to pray in private so that we might eventually lead others in effective prayer in public. When asked to pray in public, we must focus on addressing God, not on how you're coming across to others. You know, we, uh, we do get caught up in our, in our public prayers, uh, much more so than private prayer, in being politically correct, in uh, how others are going to interpret what we say, and in, uh, in, in getting lost in the idea that other people are hearing us and may be critical of the grammar we use or, or uh, uh, some other things. But that's one of the things that public prayer is about. We do try to be grammatically and politically correct. But the purpose of that prayer is to talk to God not to talk to the audience necessarily. Uh, in fact, we probably ought to be praying ourselves during periods of public prayer in, uh, in worship. So in Matthew 6, 6, Jesus went on to say, But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Again, we're not talking about material rewards. We're talking about spiritual rewards. And we're probably talking about spiritual growth in this manner. The prayer life of Jesus' followers would be radically different from those of the hypocritical religious leaders. Jesus did not condemn public prayer. Such prayer was vitally important to the early church as it is to churches today. Corporate prayer has powerful results. Jesus' point, however, was that people who prayed more in public than in private should consider their motives. If they really wanted fellowship with God, Jesus suggests that they go alone into a room, close the door, and pray. This room was probably some inner room without windows, a storeroom, a secret place, if you will, where you can have complete uh, focus on what you're doing, on the conversation you're having with your Heavenly Father. Prayer in public is subject to concern over correct word uses, political correctness, and even pride. Private prayer enables believers to literally pour out their heart to God, your Father who is unseen. 
express their true feelings and listen in the quietness for God's answer. Again, it's a conversation just like you might have had with your father, uh, your earthly father. Jesus called the father, called God the father, excuse me, an intimate word describing the relationship believers have with him. He is our father, and we need to talk to him as he is our father. I, uh, I know that some have had great problems with fathers here on earth, with their human fathers, and probably wouldn't have a conversation with him. But God gives us an opportunity to learn more about the father than, uh, than our earthly fathers do. Our earthly fathers are human, just as we are. And so, uh, when we pray, we ought to have that conversation. Leonard Ravenhill noted that self, the self-sufficient do not pray. The self-satisfied will not pray. The self-righteous cannot pray. And no man is greater than his prayer life. I find that an interesting quote. The self-sufficient do not pray. We don't need it. The self-satisfied will not pray. We're happy with who we are. And the self-righteous cannot pray because we believe we've already arrived. No man is greater than his prayer life. Then in Matthew 7 and 8, Jesus said, And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans. For they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. And that's going to bring us to some different thoughts about that. Does that mean we don't need to pray since He already knows what we need? That's not what Jesus is talking about. Repeating the same words over and over, the babbling, uh, is like a magic incantation which will not ensure that God hears these prayers. I'm, I'm reminded of, uh, of uh, was it Isaiah with the, the prophets of Baal? Uh, or was it Jeremiah? I don't remember now. It's not coming to me. But uh, they pranced and danced and preached and shouted and nothing happened. And Isaiah just said the words the one time and uh, got the results. <clears throat> the, the pagans or Gentiles focused on how they delivered their prayers repeating their words in the right order they often repeated the names of their gods as a way to get blessings as in Acts 19.34 Jesus was not condemning prayer any more than he was condemning giving in fact Jesus encouraged persistent prayer You'll read Luke 18, verses 1 through 8, and he's fixing to give us a, a pattern for prayer in verses 9 through 13. Instead, Jesus was condemning the shallow repetition of words by those who did not have a personal relationship with the Father. Jesus told his followers not to be like the pagans, but to come to God as to their Father, bringing their needs. The believers did not pray to idols of wood or stone with incessant babbling. They prayed to the one living and true God who knew what they needed even before they asked. This does not excuse believers from prayer, but they needn't spend a long time telling God their needs because he already knows. Let me repeat that. This does not excuse believers from prayers but we don't need to spend a long time telling God our needs because he already knows those. God doesn't need our prayers. He wants our prayers because he loves us. And he knows that we need them as a way of communicating with him and as a way of growing and maturing in who we are and what we are. <coughs> well, this brings us up to Matthew verse 9. And we're going to go through uh, in, the next, uh, in the next lesson, uh, we're going to go through the Lord's Prayer, uh, which is uh, uh, nine, uh, Matthew 6, verses 9 through, uh, through uh, 
what did I say it was? Matthew. Well, anyway, through the next several verses, because the Lord's Prayer covers those verses, we're uh, almost out of time this morning. And so we're going to quit there rather than start this. Uh, we'll get back to uh, this next Sunday morning. And uh, we'll uh, work through the Lord's Prayer as uh, the beginning of the lesson next time. Again, the, the two or three things that, that we learned this morning that are important. One is we are required to give to the poor. We are required. It's not when you give. It's, I mean, it's not if you give. It's when you give. So Jesus has the expectation that we're going to do that. And then when he talks about prayer, it's not if you pray, it's when you pray. And he talks about how that should be done. He does not condemn public or corporate prayer. Uh, but he encourages us to do our sincere praying in private as a conversation with our Heavenly Father. So that we, uh, so that we uh, are talking to him and knowing exactly what is, uh, what is uh, our conversation and if we're privately, quietly listening, the Holy Spirit will come back and, and give us the answers that we seek or need. And God knows what we need, so it's not a matter of putting Him on the spot. It's not a negotiation. It's simply a matter of talking to Him in a, in a way to understand that He is in control and He is in charge and that things will work out for our good uh, based on His will. So uh, as we move forward with the Lord's Prayer, uh, we'll learn more about what Jesus thought about prayer and taught. I hope you've uh, found this interesting this morning and that, uh, that we haven't uh, uh, changed your mind about giving and praying uh, other than uh, what's the correct way uh, to do it. Thank you for your participation this morning. We'll uh, look forward to uh, being back with you next Sunday morning. In the meantime, if you have questions or concerns about anything that's been said here, uh, anything that we've covered or studied, uh, please don't hesitate to uh, contact the church office or, uh, or uh, members of the church, and we'll try to provide uh, direct answers. Thank you. Have a great week.